Hello, everybody. This is our last blog, last two uh, talks. First one of them is Stanko from Infinum. Still, right? Not, not anymore. Oh, woohoo! Floating point. You have your former colleagues around, uh, so he will uh, tell us something about uh, Rust. Rust is not Rusty. Rust is a modern language used by Mozilla, right? Yeah. And yeah, introduce us to it. Thank you. Okay. So. Hello, everybody. I'll be talking, as he introduced me, about web development in Rust. So first off, let me introduce myself. My name is Tanko. Uh, I work at Floating Point currently. I'm a web developer from Zagreb here. And I've been working for five years in various consulting companies with various technologies. And this talk is kind of my experience. But, uh, first off, I naturally talk quite quickly. So don't be shy. Ask me questions. You can ask me on any medium you see here on the screen. And not to go too much in detail, this is how my coworkers describe me currently. This is actually a real quote. Uh, the life satisfaction value is arbitrary. So <coughs> let's talk about Rust or the web. So every web application we currently have, have ever made has bugs. Everybody knows that. There is no way that we can prove that there are no bugs. We can only prove that the application works as we expect it to. So, Though this is not a bug that was specifically in a web application, it was a bug that impacted all web applications. Heartbleed, a bug in SSL, caused every web application ever to be vulnerable. And it was caused by a rookie mistake, a mistake which is basically an out-of-bounds array access. It could be easily avoided and should have been. Then there is other examples like this from AT&T in the 90s. Their whole uh, system collapsed for two days because of a data race condition. Basically, they had uh, servers which resetted themselves to signify that they are overloaded. And they wanted to make that process faster. And it, they made it so fast that the servers just started reset, resetting themselves, overloading other servers. And that caused a whole cascade, which caused a blackout on the system for two days. And then there are null errors, which are so prevalent and so funny to this day. So this guy can actually never book a flight. And I did some reading into it. He married last year, and he begged his wife not to take his surnames just so that she could book flights in the future. She didn't do it. And there was an interview in the beginning of this year. She said that she regret, regrets taking his surname. And it's a simple null error. Uh, so these errors are so prevalent, there exists a thing called null island. It's an island at zero, zero. So zero lang long longitude, zero latitude, which is a buoy in the middle, middle of the ocean, which only serves, oh, the presenter, oh, sorry, which only serves to detect errors in navigational systems. So the only way you can end up there is if you want to explicitly go there, or if your GPS failed and fixed it at zero, zero, or null, null. It started out as a joke, but now it's actually used to test real, real bugs, real null pointer exceptions on GPS systems. And Knowing that all these bugs exist, how can you ever say that you can, be, you can build a system that will work, that won't fail, that can manage this sensitive data and not cause some weird issue? So systems which, which we think today to be essential bet or battle-proven have those bugs. This bank lost 100 million pounds because a hacker found a way how to create money out of thin air. He noticed that the bank had a small issue which caused it not to check uh, numbers correctly between uh, midnight and 1 a.m. And basically, he made transactions from an empty account to another empty account, and that way created money out of thin air. And the only way they found it out is because the guy turned himself in. So this brings us to Rust. Uh, when I discovered Rust back in 2015, it still wasn't version 1.0. It was kind of weird and clunky, but it promised a lot of things. So it promised memory safety. It promised the no race conditions, at least data race conditions. And it promised all that with no performance loss. Not only that, it also didn't have nil, which, if you think about it, that makes that guy, the guy's life so much easier. He can now book a flight, finally. Not only that, but if you think about it, Heartbleed would have never happened, and AT&T's data center would never go down. Those guarantees come at a huge price. Uh, the language is low level, so you can basically write an operating system in it, which is not 
not a good comparison, to be honest, because nowadays you can, I, recent, I read, uh, read on Monday, sorry, that somebody made an operating system in JavaScript, which, my god. <laughs> okay, but there, there is no garbage collector, which is usually a big no-no, and it's also compiled. But with the rise of Google's Go language, all these things, which would, as of yesterday, be a no-go for a new project on the web, are now strengths. So even though Rust has no garbage collector, collector and it's compiled, it doesn't need one. You don't need to manage memory by hand. It's all done by the compiler, magically. And that magic is accomplished with only four principles. Those are in order results and options, then ownership, borrowing, and lifetimes. So if, does anybody use Haskell here, perhaps? OK, I see one, two. OK. So results are similar to Haskell's either. And options are sim similar to Haskell's maybe functions. For those who don't know, basically, if you have a function whose name is sign in, it accepts two arguments, and it returns a result, it can return two things. It can return a user if successful, or a string if not successful, which has kind of huge implications because this function is super easy to read and understand. It checks the username and password and returns OK with the value or error with the value. Super easy. Uh, also, uh, let's just quickly explain lifetimes here. Lifetimes just say that the compiler will notice that you never use username and password after this point and will automatically remove them from memory. So you don't have to manage memory by hand. You don't have to allocate or deallocate anything ever. So how do you use it then? Well, this brings us to another strong point of Rust. It's a functional-ish programming language. So as Anyan uh, mentioned in the keynote, it's imperative, but it's also functional. It's even more functional than imperative. So you have a match operator, and you can match results to other things. So for instance, we pattern match if this is an OK, if this function returned an OK or an error, and then do the appropriate thing. And also, I will just quickly explain ownership. I won't go into borrowing. Borrowing is quite complicated and can get quite out of hand if we try to explain it now. So basically, if, we ha if you have a variable and you give it to something else, you can't use it anymore. You can think of it as if you borrow a book from a friend. When that friend gives you that book, he cannot use it anymore until you return it back. That's how ownership works. You gave ownership to the shuffle function. You can't use name anymore it, um, unless the shuffle function returns the name again here. Doesn't matter, really. So blank slide for some reason. This brings us to the web. So how can we use all those strengths I just showed to make web applications? So there are two major frameworks in Rust. One is called Rocket. The other one is called Iron. Iron is more of the classical MVC framework and supports middleware. It has a middleware stack. Request gets passed into it. It's more of your Rails or Flask or what, whatnot. But Rust is different. As it says, it promises to make uh, web applications safe and fast. And it does so by introducing type safety on the request level. So this is the simplest pattern of that. Basically, you can have multiple functions to respond to the same endpoint. So all of them respond to, oh, we are two slides ahead, sorry. All of them respond to, uh, user, to the user endpoint with ID, but every function expects a different data type. So the first one will, will respond if you send it an U size, et cetera, E size, and the third one with a string. But that's not really useful. The more useful example here is the one where you can define your own structures. So here, th this example is quite prevalent. So you don't want some user to access some data that he shouldn't, for instance, in a banking application. You can, on the request level, check if the user is the appropriate kind of user and then decide what to do with it, which isn't that impressive because we can do that already in modern web applications. But what's cool here is that those tracks don't have to be users. They can be your whole state. You can check if you have connection to database, if you have a connection to Redis, if you can contact some external service. It doesn't matter. Whatever you like, you can check for it and then do the appropriate thing afterwards. So you don't have to have if closes, switch closes, and whatnot inside your code, which can be erroneous during in uh, larger chunks of code. 
And another strong point of Rocket is that it comes with so many pre-programmed data types. So for instance, it comes with access to cookies, uh, a, J a JSON serializer, uh, form data. It comes with actually, I think, 50 different data types that you can parse and that can, it can serve you out of the, out of the box, pardons. And because everybody asked at the one point, and before I continue, please know that all benchmarks are bogeyous. No, no benchmark is good. The something that works for me doesn't have to work for you. Uh, so Rocket can provide you with up to 70,000 requests per second on a single instance. That's where, that's where the performance part of Rust comes in. And it can do so with a really, really, really small memory overhead. So when I ran those, that benchmark, I clocked my memory in at 500 megs, which I don't know if that your Java application could do such a thing. Also, uh, some people will point out that that's not really performant. There are other libraries, for, for instance, as Futures Rust. Uh, this is actually called the library is actually called Simple Futures, but you can find it under Futures minus RS. It can do up to two million requests per second. It does so with a lot of black magic, but it works, and it's battle-tested. People actually use this. Uh, I think Red Hat uses this. I'm not quite sure, though. So I managed to break my presentation. So this brings us, now that we can bring data in and out from our application, we need to store it somewhere. This brings us to an ORM system called Diesel. Diesel is developed by the guy who worked for a long, long time on active record called Sean Griffin. And he tried to make diesel to fix all the errors of active record. And it gets you everything you expect from it. I've never seen something in, in, a, different, in a different language like this. So basically, it gives you a nice DSL with which you can query stuff. It also uses the return statements, which we talked about earlier. And it gives you some other cool stuff, which are perhaps more impressive. So for instance, this, this code. Only because of this single line of code will, during compilation, connect to the database, check if the code you wrote down here is actually, corresponds actually to the database's schema and will error if it doesn't. So you can be completely safe that whatever is in your database can actually run your code. It also comes with a handy CLI tool, which is cool if you come from the world of Ruby and Active Record. But there are so many more cool other libraries that I can't, I don't have the time to pass now. There is Iron, which I talked about briefly. There is Tokyo, which is, I think, one of the fastest network libraries out there that's n except for an another one in C++. Mayo, which is a super fast uh, I.O. framework, which enables actually the performance of fu both Futures and Rocket. Rayon, which, <laughs> which enables you to use MapReduce out of the box with no problem. It introduces parallelism to all core types. You can do heavy computational loads quickly with this library. Futures, which I talked about. Then it's Juniper. That's a full GraphQL implementation in Rust. And gRPC is supported, which kind of makes it cool. And AMPQ is also supported. All these companies use R Rust live in produc production on web-facing components today. So it, starting from NPN, which uses it to optimize its uh, registry queries, to Red Hat, which uses it in uh, some components of the LDAP server implementation, to Dropbox, which uses it as a front end for its uh, data storage. So basically, anytime you send a file or retrieve a file from Dropbox, it goes through Rust. Now we come to the question of when should we use Rust? Because when I first started learning about Rust, everything looked like a nail. I had a hammer, and I could use it as an for everything I saw. So Rust is not a silver bullet. It won't save you for everything. It will save you for most errors, so data, data, con data race conditions and such things, but it won't save you from yourself. If you make an algorithmical error, that's still on you. That's why you have a job. You're here to make algorithms. There is a steep learning curve, associ curve associated with Rust, especially with the borrowing part, which is skipped hit here. And the development cycle is slower, much slower, because you have to think ahead of what you're going to do. But from my notes and my logs, I can tell you that it's about 40% slower, though you, s you spend about 30% less time debugging. 
and the bugs usually that happen are purely alg alg algorithmical, not something weird. So what should we use it for? We should use it for processing sensitive data. So imagine a fintech company like a bank or whatever, booking flights. That's where it excels. It's safe. Out of the box, everything is UTF-8. Anything that you try to do, like instance uh, access an array, will error if you try to do it in some erroneous way, like out of bounds or something. If you try to increment an integer and overflow it, it will error. It won't throw. It will just return a result that's error. You can also use it in high throughput applications. As we saw with futures, RS, you can get up to 2 million requests per second, which means that anything li like off servers and uh, database frontends can use it without any problem. And in a nutshell, you should use it on systems that are too important to fail. So another good rule of thumb is if you want to use Go, think about Rust. Because Rust has everything that Go has, and it's much safer. It can make your life so much easier. And that's it, folks. Any questions? And please leave feedback. The guys over from webcam said that's super important. OK, for questions, please raise your hand and keep it up. Hey. Um, hey. How did you change as a developer after you learned the Rust? Uh, so the question is how I changed as a developer after I learned Rust. So coming from a background of primarily Ruby, uh, the big change was noticing that the programming language held my hand. So every time I tried to make something that was uh, a threading issue, that was a race condition, the compiler complained. At first, it was super frustrating because you think that you're smarter than the compiler. But then I went to the forums, and the forums basically said, if you get an error, it's probably your fault. Uh, actually, in the five years of development, they only found two legit errors with the compiler. Like, and one was super weird, and the other one was just somebody forgot to put a semicolon. Um, but it changed me in the way that I kind of appreciate compiled languages and the strength that the compiler gives me much, much more. And I actually think that there are good tools to make core product, well, the core of your product. Hi. Next question? Yep. Yeah. Great talk, thanks. Uh, you say that Rust is performant. Could you please compare, just generally, how it is fast when compared to C? To C? Um, depends, depends on the use case. So from my benchmarks, uh, it's faster when if you write the same code, so the same error checking code in C and in Rust, Rust will excel because it goes through uh, the LLV LLVM, which then does some low-level optimizations. And because Rust has a functional paradigm, so by default, everything is immutable. It doesn't have to do some checks, and it can do some more advanced optimizations than in C. Then it turns out to be faster. But if you know exactly what you're doing, so if you know that there is no way you can get some error, then C is faster, because you, as the human, simply know more about the program than the interpreter. So at, on one hand, you get faster results if you do the same thing in C and in Rust. But if you optimize on the program level in C, you'll get much faster results in C, though no safety there. Any more? Um, I think there's one. There's me. Uh, Hi. So uh, I guess one of the other good things about Rust is that it's more expressive than Golang. And it's if you're probably writing, uh, considering writing a new, completely new application, web application from scratch, you shouldn't use C++, but use Rust because it should be C++ fixed or C++ without a legacy, as I understand. And in terms of um, performance difference, I guess it should be Minimum, minimal, and if you want to use unsafe uh, br uh, brackets in Rust, then you can also write something that's completely on par with C, as I understand uh, the, 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 the language at the moment. Yeah. The question uh, was, uh, what kind of uh, development uh, uh, editors or environments you use for coding Rust? OK, so um, IntelliJ actually put out, put out a good ID recently. Though I, didn't, I don't use it, I'm a religious Vim user, and 
I just try to use Vim for everything. It's not the best solution, but it works in my case. Yeah, go on. Yeah, there is uh, somebody implemented, uh, you know, the you complete me uh, plugin for Vim. It's a language server. So basically, somebody implemented Rust for that language server, and it works am amazing, even on large code bases. Um, I tried to build Servo. You know what Servo is? So for those that don't know, Servo is uh, Mozilla's pet project. They, so if you use Firefox, especially Firefox 57, you use nearly 40% of Servo in it. Uh, it's, I think, the fastest browser to date. And I built, I was, I managed, it managed to handle it with all its. I even used it in my final paper for college. Anyone else? Can you comment on using Rust from other languages? Because that's a common theme. Like it seems that Rust with other languages. Yeah, there's a lot of bindings yeah. from higher level languages. Uh, you can actually, in the garbage collecting and everything, you can drop down to Rust. Yeah. So um, Rust can export a foreign function interface that is, that is identical to C. So not to go into the specific how that works, that means that anywhere you can use uh, a C extension, you can basically use a Rust extension with no penalty. Uh, why people choose to use Rust is because of all dimension safety. So I have been using Rust for two years, and from my experience, I can tell you that at when, the, when you compile your program, you can be 95 to 100% sure that it won't fail at runtime for any reason. And when it comes to, for instance, uh, Ruby, since I know that you're from the Ruby community, uh, in Ruby, if you, do, uh, if you do in a native extension some kind of code that for some reason seg faults, that won't, kill, that won't throw an exception in Ruby. That will kill the whole virtual machine. So your application will just get thrown out of memory. That's not, some, not something that can happen in Rust. Same goes for Elixir. As uh, Sasha mentioned on his workshop, there are NIFs, and if it was mentioned on the keynote, there are NIFs, and there was also an example of using NIFs with Rust. Uh, people use it because it's safe. It can, it's simply, it's a much lower chance to fail. It has a much lower chance to fail than C. Um, in C, you can get weird pointer exceptions. You can use data in weird ways to access weird stuff. Rust doesn't allow you that. The moment you try to do something that's not thread safe, not memory safe, the compiler will complain loudly, and it won't let you do stuff unless, as uh, somebody mentioned here, you use unsafe uh, blocks. And when you use unsafe blocks, there is no reason in using Rust. Basically, you can write in anything else. Anybody else? In that case, take a break, get a coffee. Thank you, Stanko. No problem.